welcome to an introduction to iMovie, Basic Editing and Beyond. I am Carolyn Bennett-Glauda, the Librarian for Education and Outreach at Southeastern New York Library Resources Council. In a moment, I'm going to turn our webinar over to our presenter, Veronica Reynolds. She's a librarian from uh, New City Library in Rockland County, and she first presented this um, as part of a workshop at CENICON in April. So with that, I again want to thank you for being here with us today um, for all the work that you're doing to keep libraries vital and relevant. We really appreciate you and the work that you do. And uh, Veronica, it is all yours. All right. Good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Veronica Reynolds. I am the head of community relations at the New City Library. And I got into editing videos, I think as much people, many people might have at the beginning of the pandemic. It just became a way for us to reach out. So we had a YouTube channel that hadn't been used in seven years, but I still had the login for, and I was home. And the only computer I had was my home laptop, which happens to be a Mac. And the lovely thing about Apple products is they do come with software built in. And one of the pieces of software that's built in is iMovie. So I won't say it's free because of course the computer itself is not a particularly cheap machine, but it does come with it. So if you have a Mac in your library, it should have a version of iMovie on it. I do recommend always keeping that up to date if possible, but even older versions of iMovie can offer you quite a lot in the way of editing. So the plan today is I'm gonna walk you through how I edit a video in the software. And as I go through giving you a tour of the software as well, I will keep my eye on the chat as we go through. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them there. If it's a more overarching question, I might save it to the end, but I absolutely wanna clarify things as we go along too. It's a lot of little buttons. Um, PCs do not use iMovie. There is a built-in movie maker in some versions of Windows. I haven't played with the one that's in Windows 10. It's not as robust. Um, if you are looking to use a video editor and you wanna pay for one, um, most libraries are eligible to use TechSoup and you can get the Adobe Creative Cloud and many of the programs in there are movie editors. They are more robust than iMovie, which does mean they have a slightly higher learning curve. So just keep that in mind as you tackle them. Um, and for now, let's get into it. So here we go. All right. Oh, hold on, let me make sure I share correctly with all the sound chosen. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so when you open up iMovie, this is the screen that you're gonna see. And you have two options here at the top. You have projects and media. It will default to opening on the projects page. Um, and there you'll see all your previous projects that you've worked on. Each individual project is a separate movie. Um, I don't save all of them, but I save a great deal of them. So you'll see some familiar and unfamiliar faces if you know people from my library. Um, I like to keep them all as separate projects so I can distinguish them. Although sometimes I will start using one as a template. So if I'm doing similar movies like um, a virtual story time or I'm using the same music and headers and stuff, I might have one that I use like, as a template where I edit into it um, the most recent video just as a time saver. But the other option that you have on your home screen is this media home screen. And this is where you'll see all previous media that you've uploaded. So all these separate projects with all of their files attached to them. But I like to start in that projects window. And the first thing I'm usually gonna do is create a brand new project. You'll get a choice whether to do a movie or a trailer. A trailer is a template that iMovie has set up where you can kind of drag and drop pictures and short movies into it. And it's got like cool editing effects that you don't have to add in yourself. Um, you may wanna use a trailer if you're doing um, something straightforward, like maybe a quick fundraising video that you wanna keep short and you are not super confident in your editing skills and you just wanna have it kind of pre-processed for you. They're really useful for that but they are set up like Hollywood movie trailers. And if you forget that, it'll tell you that right here. I prefer to start with a movie, which is a blank slate. And we'll get this window. So what you'll notice right away is that even though I said it's a blank slate, there is stuff in here already. Because what iMovie does is create its own library of files. So everything that you drag and drop into it, it saves into its media. It saves it as separate events. 
events or instances of movies. And you'll see all the media attached to that is in here. This is the music that I use. This was our um, final slide for a while. And there you can see the different takes of me trying to read Pride and Prejudice. Um, this was a beginning experiment in YouTube that I was doing that didn't go over very well. Um, but all the media is still there. So if I ever wanted to grab that for a movie that I was doing later, I could go and get that pretty easily. So I just want to walk you through before we even start editing, just the layout here. So our first layout is what I like to call our assets menu. So on the left, like I said, you have all your project media. You'll see right here, my movie 19. That is the um, blank project that we're working on. It gives it that title. Um, I can go ahead, if I back out, it's gonna prompt me to save it as a title. So we're gonna save this as yogurt dip because that's the one we're gonna do. And even if I've done absolutely nothing to it, you'll see that it still appears here. And then I can double click on it. Um, someone says they're using an iPod Air, media not available at the top, only projects. Um, that's fine, it's probably just a different version. You still have access to all your media and I'm gonna walk you through that right now. So all of your assets are in this editing window here. You'll see my media, which is like I said, all of the stuff that you've uploaded yourself. And then you have audio. So there's a few things that you have access to in audio. There are built-in sound effects that come with iMovie. Again, depending on your version is what you get. Some of them are literally um, sound effects. But some of them are what they call jingles, which are DRM free. So you can use them in YouTube. You won't get flagged for copyright. And they're jingles. You can sort them by time, by genre. If you want the jingles, which is really the music, you have to sort by genre. So it lumps them all together. Time is interesting. So if you know you have like 10 seconds of music that you need, you can just organize it by time and grab something that's exactly as long as you need. And they all have different moods. Um, you'll see outside of sound effects, you do have access to GarageBand. So if you're the kind of person who likes to compose music, um, good on you, that's not me, but I, uh, respect, I respect that. And you can grab those right um, in here. And it'll also grab your iTunes library. So you can click music and get access to your iTunes library on that machine. Um, there you do have to be careful though, because that music may be copyright protected. And if your plan is to eventually upload it somewhere, it may get flagged. So just keep that in mind when you're choosing your music. Another place to get music is if you do have a YouTube channel and that's what you're uploading to, there is a really great um, asset in YouTube studio, which is where you go to upload your, your videos. And that is their audio library. And that is all DRM free music. And you can even sort um, by not recording uh, by things that you don't need to credit. So you can choose um, no attribution required. So you don't even have to credit the musician um, and they have a ton of great music. They'll hear one of their songs later because I'm gonna use one. Um, so yeah, you have a lot of choices here. And don't be surprised if as you're going through these jingles, if you're a YouTube watcher, you may recognize some of these with some of your favorite YouTubers may use them. The next set of assets is titles. So for this, I am gonna grab my photo here. My, so I'll show you how to do this momentarily. But just so we have a background, that's actually, you know what, I'm gonna delete that and I'm gonna grab a plain background from the next thing. I'll explain backgrounds in a second. I just want you to be able to see the titles. So the titles, even though they're all shown against black, they're automatically green screened essentially. So whatever you drag them over, it's just the text style that will show up and you can go ahead and type in a title. You have to keep these pretty short. It does not handle long titles particularly well because if you hit return, it just considers that an enter. You kind of have to like hand space it. It just kind of makes it smaller. So if you're gonna have multiple, like a title and a subtitle, you wanna make sure you grab something that allows for it. So you can see this one called line has a space for a title and a subtitle. And often they're animate. So if you hit play, you can see that it'll pop in. So you can just float those titles over everything and it doesn't have to be a solid background. You can float them over um, anything. If you've ever done something where you're interviewing people, you may want something in the corner, just saying who they are. 
So you could have that person being interviewed just like in a History Channel documentary and you can float their name and maybe their title underneath as well. So these are wonderful assets and what goes with them are backgrounds. So backgrounds can be used with those titles. They can also be used if you're using a green screen. Um, green screens are rather scarce last year. I did manage to secure us one. Um, iMovie is not necessarily the sharpest green screen use. So just be prepared for whatever you do to look like it's been green screened. You're not gonna get CGI um, from Jurassic Park level quality. It'll be obviously green screened. Um, but it's still a nice asset. So you could green screen someone on them. And some of these you'll see can move. So this is an important thing to note too. As you go across any of these uh, backgrounds, you'll see you get like a really, it might be hard to see on your screen, but there's a small orange bar and you can see that it's animating. So I know that this moves and it's showing me that preview. That's called skimming. You can do that with audio and video throughout iMovie. You can just kind of drag your mouse over and you'll either hear or see the effect that you're trying to induce. I love this one. I've used underwater in like a bunch of summer videos. And then the rest of these are stills. They're just colors that you can grab up. So these are good as basic um, quick grabs. Another free resource, if you don't already know about it, I feel like a lot of people who do library media probably know, but Pixabay, um, which I will type in the chat, is a free resource um, for Pixabay.com, is a good free resource for um, like stock photography. Obviously it's not as robust as something you're paying for, but that's some really great pictures. And one of the things you can search for is just backgrounds and it has a ton of them. So I've used those in videos as well. After backgrounds, we have transitions. I'll go over these a little bit more once we have clips laid down. Um, but again, you can do that drag over and it'll give you an idea of what that transition will look like. There are simple ones like a cross dissolve, um, which I'll talk more about, but I like cross dissolve a lot because it's fairly subtle and it's good if you're doing like an abrupt cut in a video from one thing to another. Um, <clears throat> but then you have some that are a little bit more PowerPoint-esque is how I would describe them. If anyone remembers when PowerPoint used to be all about these transitions. So you have those as options as well. I use this one for like a million story time videos, which is the page curl, because it's appropriate. Um, okay. So that is our assets. That's everything that I, iMovie comes with just out of the box to help you. So the next part of this is gonna be actual editing. So I wanna show you the two ways that you can put media into iMovie. So while this is our asset screen, this is our preview and where a lot of our editing tools live, down here is the heartbeat of the program. This is where all of our materials go for editing. Um, you can drag and drop things in just from other folders, or you can go to file, import media, and choose. Um, I have everything set in a folder that I'm gonna grab up, but I'm gonna start with my movie. Because it is a Mac, um, it does depend on who's sending you a movie, if it'll just automatically work. So if it's being sent from another Apple device, it'll work without a problem. But you may find that if it's being sent from somewhere else, um, that it will go into the program just fine, but won't appear to have any sound. What you need to do with that is um, what you can right click on the, on the movie itself. And all the way at the bottom of your list of actions in that menu is encode selected video files. You may have to do that if things are sent to you from a Windows computer or from a third party camera. These are all ways that you can do that. Okay. So you'll see when I drop this in, now my look changes. I'm just gonna say, just to give credit where credit's due, the video I'm gonna be editing today as an example is from one of our children's librarians, Amy Chessman. Amy's an amazing children's librarian who works at our New City Library with me. And she was very polite in letting me use her video as a test video, so I hope you're all kind to her. She's been doing a series of um, simple recipes for kids, and she was recording them in her home kitchen on her iPad, so I didn't have to encode those videos. They came to me like this. One of the first things you'll see is that it's saying I'm at zero seconds of five minutes and 31 seconds. And that's because of this gray bar 
that's a little hard to see because as I move, of course, you'll see the white bar coming across. But we always start at the beginning of the clip. And you'll see that it looks pretty small. That's because of the view setting I have it on. So this bar here lets me enlarge and lengthen so I can get in as small as I want, editing down to like a microsecond if need be. Um, and you'll see next to there, I even have settings. You can choose a theme. I recommend against this. This is very much like that trailer, where it's just gonna auto do everything for you, but you won't have a lot of control over it. Especially when you're beginning to edit, I think it's better to learn how to do everything yourself. Um, but if you're doing something really quick, that's a good place to grab it. It's a lot like if you've used Microsoft Word, the inbuilt themes in that. Um, you'll also see, you can add filters. So if you're, and you know, want to do, make it look like a film noir film, you can do that really quick just by adding those filters. You can trim the background music. So if there's already music, it'll do that for you. Um, if you are only going to use a single clip and you're not going to put anything in front or behind it, you can just put those fade in from blacks to fade out from blacks right in it. And this is another version where you can make the clip look bigger if you're having trouble seeing it. I keep it pretty small and you'll see why, but you can make it quite large if you're concerned about that. The last thing is the audio about showing waveforms. So if you can see what's toggling on and off there, those are our waveforms. That's the sound that accompanies the video. Now you have two choices when you load in a movie. You can leave the sound as is, obviously you'll edit it, but you can leave it attached or you can right click, right click on your uh, clip here and you can choose to detach the audio, which turns it into a separate soundtrack. The reason you may want to do that is you may want to delete the audio from the video clip that you have. You can just get rid of it. So let's say you wanted to do an establishing shot outside of your library, but it was a windy day. So the camera picked up a lot of wind noises. Well, you can delete all the audio off of that clip, just have that footage and you can add your own sound underneath it. I'll show you how to do a voiceover and you can also add music. You have a lot of choices. Now, before I add fun stuff like music and opening clips, before I even begin to look if anything needs to be cut or needs a transition, if this is my whole um, meat, excuse me, the whole meat of my video, I edit the audio and the visual first because if I start clipping it, I want it to be consistent. Um, and it's just easier to do that first and then break it up. So that's when our other um, menu comes into play here. The first thing that you're going to see is that you can toggle these menus off entirely to make your preview bigger. You can make your preview huge if you want. You can make it really tiny. I kind of leave it at the default. I like having equal access to everything. And because so much of the work is done here, I don't like this being so huge that it's hard to manipulate down here. You have to make sure that your clip is selected. You'll know it's selected because you're gonna get that yellow box all the way around it. That becomes important when you have multiple clips. You wanna make sure you have the right one selected. And the first thing that we can do is um, do the, the lighting or the color essentially. And you'll notice that it comes with this really great button that says auto. It's a subtle change. I'm going to toggle it on and off so you can see what it's doing. Do you see how it's balancing her skin tone and the kitchen? This is the easiest thing to do is to just click auto and let iMovie decide for you what needs to be done. As I've gotten a little more confident with iMovie, I've used the rest of these as well. Um, match color is really interesting. It lets you pull from another part of the clip. So let's say you we're filming outside and the sun changed angle um, and the coloring changed entirely. You can ask it to make match both of the clips together and try and bring that lighting together more cohesively, which can be really useful. And then there's white balance. So what white balance is, you can see I get my little ink dropper. I can find a spot in the video that's white and ask it to balance the rest of the video against that. And you'll see if I choose something that's not white, it's gonna throw the color all out of whack. So I try and keep it in a white. So I could do that instead of auto. Or I could use skin tone balance, where again, I get my dropper and I can choose from Amy's different pieces of her skin and balance it so maybe it's a little more flattering and balance it against her skin tone. 
This becomes particularly important when you're doing a story time video. So I do want to just briefly take you quickly into a different project. So this is one of our children's librarians. You can see she's reading a book in the clip. And if I turn off the white balance, so we get a good thing here. If I turn the white balance on and off, you can see it makes the book way more legible. So that's just something to keep in mind. So white balance off, white balance on. I point this out only because some of you may be doing story time videos and it makes the white balance makes the biggest difference when you're reading books that have a lot of white in them. My other recommendation in general with that is um, if you're doing picture books, encourage whoever's reading the book to choose ones that don't have super shiny pages. Very shiny pages can get a lot of glare from your lighting um, and that's difficult to edit around. You sometimes can't get it back. So that is our lighting. I know I've gone over a lot already. Does anyone have any questions? I'll keep an eye on the chat. Kind of akin to our color balance. We do have this palette here. So if you've already nudged it around, but you're still not happy, you have a few choices. You can bring our light down so you can make it more shadowy. It'll always conveniently leave a line where it was so you can go back. There's always a reset button here too. Or you can diminish the shadows a little bit. So you can see for us, that kind of makes this particular clip look overexposed, which you may want to avoid. Where does white balance appear throughout the whole video. So when I'm balancing the color, um, even though you're only seeing one, sh um, one still image, it's doing the entire clip that I'm editing. So there's the white balance here. Just go over that again. Because of the way Amy's lighting is in her kitchen, it actually winds up making the video a little bluer than if I do a skin tone balance. It becomes a little bit warmer. So why might you wanna use eliminating shadows and eliminating some of the light? You may find that your video came out more overexposed um, depending on your lighting situation. Well, I do recommend whenever possible to film in a studio setup where you have control over the lights. Um, I especially discourage as I've discovered filming in any place that has fluorescent bulbs as its primary lighting, which is most library buildings. Um, because even though we don't always perceive them flickering, the video cameras, especially the better ones, do pick it up and you'll see your lighting fluctuates um, and it's quite distracting. So anywhere you can control the lighting um, just gives you a better head start. But this is one way to decrease overexposure because you can bring the light down um, or if it came out a little dark, you might be able to lighten it up um, and get it to a better spot. This is your saturation slider. So this increases your color saturation and this decreases it. So if you don't want to go full black and white, but maybe you want it to be a little sepia, again, this can be due to under or overexposure. You can see how yellow the spot on her cabinet gets with that saturation. And it disappears as I bring it down and we go all the way into black and white. This is warmth and coolness. You can add in more yellow or you can add in more blue. This is something to play around with if you're concerned about the mood of your video. Um, you know, blue is a cooler tone. It may make a, a, may evoke a different feeling than something that's really yellow and warm. So it's something to keep in mind as you're beginning to edit. Okay. I'm gonna show you these again when I add images into this clip, but just so you can see it now. Um, the, this is cropping. It's particularly useful when you have a still image. So when you're putting a picture in, it really helps. So I'm just gonna grab, I happen to have a, um, an unrelated image here. I was doing our e-newsletter and that's a book for one of our book clubs. So when I say fit, it's fit the image in so nothing gets cut off. You can hit crop to fill and then you can select which part of it remains. It's gonna auto select. If I did crop to fill here, from New City it's gonna do that. Or my favorite, you can do a Ken Burns effect. So those of you who are familiar with Ken Burns, you know in his documentaries, they often go to like one image to another. And you can see my arrow here will show you what direction it's going to um, do its zoom in. 
and where it's going to end. So if I wanted the whole book cover, I can start it up here. I can end it here. I can, you can move this around. It can be on a diagonal. You can have a lot of fun with this. And what that winds up looking like is, you can see it scans across the book cover. I'm the same from so that's particularly useful if you're doing um, a video that actually is way more focused on individual images, because you can do that. You don't have to have moving images throughout your whole video, or even at a ball if you don't have them. Um, you know, if you're doing something that explains a project that's happening at the library and you're just using stills, you can use that Ken Burns effect just to make it a little more visually interesting. Continue back through our menu here. Stabilize shaky video. So this is actually the longest process you can do. Um, I'm not gonna even click this button because it does take a few minutes to process the whole video. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, but this is great if let's say one of your librarians filmed a really cool outside movie, but the person who's holding the camera didn't have a tripod, which I cannot recommend enough. Invest in a tripod, they're pretty inexpensive. If you're gonna be filming anything, you can get ones that hold your phone on Amazon for like $20 um, because uh, you don't realize how much your hand shakes just all the time <laughs> until you're trying to film videos and they're shaky. This doesn't do a perfect job, but it can lessen it. You'll see that it's a percentile slide so you can make it um, better or worse. Um, rolling shutter is if you are filming from like a moving vehicle you will sometimes get a effect where it almost looks like, um, it's a good word for it. It looks like a, a calliope, one of the old like moving images. It just makes it very like jerky. So you can do this. You can see again, there's medium and high. And if you decide you don't like how it comes out, you can click reset. What will sometimes happen, the way it stabilizes that video is it picks the stillest point in the image and kind of stabilizes out from there. So sometimes the image comes out a little skewed or not quite what you were envisioning. That's something to keep in mind. Um, I was gonna say this later, but I'll say it now. Just like documents that you make, video should have a proofer. So what I mean by that is not just because you might write things on them and misspell them, although I have done that. Um, it's just, what I do is because I don't make the videos. I, I get sent the videos and then I edit them. Um, I always send them back to the person who created them in the first place, and they have to approve it before it goes up on the YouTube channel. Just like with a the document, they may notice something that you just didn't notice because you were so concentrated on editing it. Um, so that's what I recommend. Um, definitely make sure you have that. The reset option is on every menu. So let's say I went to audio, resets right here. Um, if I was in the color and I don't like the changes I made, reset is right here. If I don't like the editing I did, resets right here. Definitely make sure you have what? Uh, make sure you have somebody proofing it. You should have a second pair of eyes. I can't emphasize that enough. You know, nobody you should work in a void. Um, absolutely have somebody who has a good eye take a look at your videos before they get posted. One, because it may be something as simple as typos. You'll see in a bit that I float images over this video. And if there's a typo in that, it doesn't look great. Um, but it's also just somebody saying, oh, the color does look good. Oh, you know, I can't hear it at this point. Oh, the, it, the volume isn't quite right here. Um, right, you can always reset and re-edit. Yeah, the reset option's always there. The cool thing about these projects is they retain all the settings. So you can go in later and reset. Um, and you can also keep the raw footage. All the raw, this clip up here is unedited. I haven't touched this and it's gonna be there forever. So I could delete this and all the changes I made to it if I really don't feel like going in and resetting everything. And I can drag this original clip down and start over if I wanted to. Um, that goes into the library forever. I always have that as an asset. Okay. So let's talk about sound. Um, just like with um, the visual, you can go ahead and just hit auto on sound. So I'm gonna play you just for a second. Amy is wonderful, but she's a little bit far away from the camera. So you'll be able to hear what it sounds like before I touch it. I'm Miss Amy from New City Library and welcome back to my kitchen. Today, I So you'll notice it's a little soft because she's not right up against a microphone. You know, on a professional cooking show, she might be wearing a lavalier mic like clipped somewhere that you can't see it. Um, I like to play a fun game with TV shows now, which is like, see if you can find the mic on people. Um, it, 
some shows are way better at hiding it than others, especially watch like a cooking channel or an HGTV. It's fun to try and spot the mic. Um, but Amy's not wearing a mic. She's letting her iPad pick the sound up. So it's not super loud. So you'll notice, watch the waveforms down here. These like light blue up and down lines. I'll actually, I'll zoom in so you can see them a little bit better. Okay. Even just hitting auto, you can see if I turn it off and on, it jumps up. So auto, one of the things auto is going to do is adjust the volume for us a little bit. So now we can hear it just on the auto setting. I'm Miss Amy from New City Library and welcome back to my kitchen. So it's louder, but probably not as loud as we want it. This is just a volume adjuster. So I can go ahead and bring it up all the way to 400%, which I do tend to do with Amy's videos. I'm Miss Amy from New City Library and welcome back to my kitchen. All right, so that's an improvement, but you may have noticed if you have a good ear and your audio is particularly good today, that there's an airplane sound happening in the background. I'm gonna come back to lower volume of other clips because I haven't added my music in yet. Um, but there's clearly a plane flying overhead in the background of your video. So when I go to this menu here, I can reduce the background noise. Now this isn't a perfect editor, but it helps a lot. And I can choose how much I wanna reduce it by. The more you reduce it, it does get a tinnier sound, but I'm gonna to go to 100% just so you can hear the difference. I'm Miss Amy from New City Library and welcome back to my kitchen. Today, so you might hear a little bit of a burr if you're listening really closely, but the loud sound of takeoff. Also in this menu, you'll see my equalizer, not mine, the equalizer. What this does, if you have multiple sounds happening at the same time, you can choose which one you want to dominate. So there's a voice enhance, music enhance, loudness, which if the 400% volume doesn't do enough, you can do loudness, hum reduction, which um, is particularly useful if you film somewhere that has an HVAC system, air conditions and fans make like a low hum. I'm gonna use this on top of my reduced background noise in a minute to further reduce that background sound. But you can boost your bass and your treble or reduce them. So I'm gonna do a hum reduction on this. One thing to notice whenever you choose any of these options, you'll see this upload button here. It'll briefly turn into a circle um, as it processes and it'll fill the circle. Now, because this is a short video clip, it's doing it rather quickly, so you may not see it, but I'll show you when we go to export at the end, um, how that works. So let's hear how Amy responds. I'm Miss Amy from New City Library and welcome back to my kitchen. Now you'll notice she may sound a little tinnier. So if you're not happy with that trade-off of the hum reduction, you might wanna do a voice enhance instead. I'm Miss Amy from New City Library and welcome back to my kitchen. So you can play around with these, listen to it a bunch of times. I'm gonna leave it on voice and enhance for today. Um, then we're gonna leave sound behind. We're gonna go into some fun stuff. This is where you can freeze frame, speed things up, slow it down. So this is kind of just fun editing tricks. So the first thing I'm gonna to need to do to make this work, because I don't wanna necessarily affect my entire video with this, is something really important, which is splitting your clip. So we've already done all our um, audio and light adjustments and um, color adjustments that we wanna do to this video. You don't have to worry about doing any more of that. Um, so now I can start splitting it up. So what, what I can do is go up here to edit. Oh, where's my split clip? Sorry, one moment. I usually use the, um, a keyboard shortcut for this, so I apologize. Um, I just knew where it was and now it's fine. I'm gonna right click instead. So you can actually right click down here, it's the easier way to do it anyway. And you'll see there's a split clip. There's a keyboard shortcut, which is what I use, Command B, and that separates your clip. And now you can edit them separately. They're different things. So if I wanted to, I can now make the speed of this fast and I can choose eight times speed if I want. And you'll see I've got a bunny rabbit now. Today, I'd like. So that can be a fun thing to do if you're just having some fun editing a video, editing a clip, and you just want to speed something up. So I might use that, let's say, if she was doing something really repetitive and I didn't want to cut because I thought it was more fun if she was doing it really fast. Um, or you can slow it down um, if you want to really show something happening very intensely. 
or you can freeze frame. So you can just freeze in the middle of a video on one image and then restart it. So that's what that is. Here's your crop filters again, which we saw earlier in settings. You can also do audio effects. So if you want it to sound like you're in a cathedral or a different size room, you can pitch it up and pitch it down. I'm Miss Amy from New City Library and welcome back to my kitchen. So you can play with these and preview them. I don't use these very often. I know they're there. I'm not super interested in them for the most part, but if you're doing stuff for kids, that could be really fun. Um, and this is just the information panel. It's just telling me the name of the clip that I'm editing and how long it is. So you'll see this one. Okay. So I'm going to reunite my clips here. The next thing I'd want to do is start adding in all the little things that make the video edit. So I have to get the rest of my files going. So you'll see already I have my image here. So I create a lot of my thumbnail images, which is the still image that you'll see on YouTube as a preview to a video. I make all of mine in Adobe Spark, which is kind of their answer to Canva, but Canva has a really nice setup to make these too. Um, with Canva and Spark, if you're a paying customer, you can animate them. I do animate some of them. This one happens to be a still just for, um, for easiness sake. You don't have to put them at the beginning of your video as well, like I do. It's just a formatting thing that I like to use. I don't like a cold open. Um, I do limit it down. You see, when you drop in an image, it's gonna default to about six seconds of the image being up. That's way too long. Six seconds just adds up to a lot. I usually shorten it to four. So the way you start shortening things, you can see my clip here. If I bring my arrow down along that yellow border, you'll see I get an arrow going like this. And I can click and drag it and it's going to tell me right here, probably a little hard to see, I apologize. It'll tell you about how long the clip is in that gray box. And I wanna get it down to about four seconds. So already now we've got that going up and then it transitions into the video. But you can see that's a rather rude transition. And that's where these come in handy. I'm gonna grab my favorite, which is just cross dissolve, which is nice and simple. It's not showy. And that turns that sharp, transition to that, which is very natural. Then I have to add in my music. So like I said, I love to grab music from the audio library on YouTube because it's free um, and it's quite nice. They have a lot, none of it's sung for the most part, but I'll show you that I have an entire MP3 track here. It's called Fond Memories. And you'll see when I drop this in, it's three minutes long. I don't let music play throughout my videos because I just find it's a little distracting. Um, if I drop it in, it lands below. And now we're going to get it below. Um, and they can play simultaneously. You could just leave it like that. But one of the sound things I didn't show you before is this right under the audio here lower volume of other clips. This is really useful because it just automatically lowers the volume of the music or any other clip you're playing so that the original clip gets to dominate it. So we're gonna go ahead and hit that. But then we're gonna edit it. I just wanna use this as intro music. So I definitely don't need three minutes. Um, and it works exactly like um, the uh, visual clips where you can lengthen it and shorten it by going like this. Um, and then you can pick it up like a building block. Bloop. Now this looks really long and rather than scrolling across the bottom here to find the other end of it, this is when I might make my view shorter. It makes it way easier just to shorten that up to where I want it. So it went from three minutes to four seconds. And then I'm gonna make it larger again. I want it to go a little bit longer. I want it to overlap into her intro a little bit. But it's gonna to be too loud because as you know, it's not the loudest video. So when I hover over a music video, You'll see I get these little tug ties here, these little tiny circles. You can barely see them. But if I hover over them, I get a different kind of arrow. If I click and drag that, it'll auto fade. So it'll start out loud and go soft. And that sounds like this. It worked just a I'm Miss Amy from New City Live. So that gives me already a really nice sound bite. But I'm noticing that it takes a while to walk in and I don't necessarily want that silence or that view of the kitchen. 
And that's what I'm going to go in and shorten again. Just pull that tight. And what I'm looking at when I do that is the sound of the waveform. Because you can see right here, the waveform spikes up. So I can just pull it to where that waveform starts. And I know I'm going to get it to where she starts talking because that's when the volume spikes. And now we should have this. Hi, Miss Amy from New City Library, and welcome back to my kitchen. Today, I'd like... So that's already made a tremendous improvement. Uh, the name of that sound is called Fond Memories. Um, I wind up using a lot of classical. Will iMovie accept any image format for the intro slide? Yes, it does expect, it takes a JPEG, it takes a ping, it takes a GIF. Um, you can drop really almost any media into iMovie. It's really only picky about the movies themselves. It does want those to be um, ideally in .mov. Like I said, you can encode them if it comes out strangely. You may struggle with like an MP4 or something like, well, no, not MP4, but different movie formats can be problems. But images, it doesn't care. It takes MP3s and MP4s for the music as well. Um, it's really only picky about um, video formatting. So then I'm really ready to actually get into the editing, editing of the video. I know it seems like we've done a lot, but my next thing that I usually do is look for dead space in the sound. So I don't set it super granularly for that because everyone naturally has pauses and how they talk. So if you go like this, you're gonna see lots of little pauses, but those are natural. But then you might see a longer pause like this. So what Amy's doing here is she wanted to make sure that all of the uh, cool whip or whip popping that she was using got in there. There is a like short spike sound, but I would play that. It's just her banging against the bowl. So that's not even her talking. She doesn't start talking again. Until this is a crowd pleaser, just about everybody. So you have two choices here. You could add music back in and let it play so there's no dead sound. You could leave it as is and just say that's how it is. You could clip it and, um, you know, make it go super fast or super slow like we saw before. But what I wanna show you is just how to get rid of pauses. So I right click here at the end and I would split my clip. And once it's split, I would get rid of that dead space. And now the thing to notice though, once I've done that. Well, this is a crowd pleaser. Um, that actually translated really nicely. You don't always get that lucky, but you see how the whipped cream kind of jumps, which can be a little bit jarring. That's where I might throw in another cross dissolve. Let me get this. To the mixing bowl. This is a crowd pleaser just about everybody likes. It looks a little bit softer and more natural, and it means that Amy's like not like jumping around as I edit out those pauses. Um, I try and edit out anything that lasts for longer than two or three seconds because it comes very noticeable, um, especially if it's a tech issue or anything like that. One of the things I would do, for instance, in webinars that I'm uploading, um, to protect patron privacy, I edit out any questions that are asked out loud, especially at the end. Because um, even though they know it's being recorded, they may not realize that it's going to be in the public sphere. So I edit out all those questions. And I can often find those um, by changing the waveforms. Um, the reason I emphasize looking at the waveforms is this is already a five minute video, which doesn't sound very long. But if you're trying to live play it and find every single pause by listening to it, that's going to take you way longer than five minutes because you're going to pause every single time, stop, edit the clip, replay. So editing a five minute video becomes a way longer process. You may want to do that for things that need to be a super high quality for one reason or another. Um, but for most videos that you're going to put up where you want to put some work into it, but you don't not necessarily trying to deliver an Oscar winning performance, you can skim those waveforms. For a five minute video, I probably will do it that way where I listen to the whole thing and edit as I go along because it doesn't increase my workload that much. But I'm frequently editing webinars, which are an hour and a half long. Um, and I can usually tell really easy places to delete like whole minutes. So for instance, if you start your webinar and maybe like this webinar, Caroline and I were just talking for a while, um, I would skim over all of that and just go, you know, I knew that we started recording 15 minutes in and I would skim it and, and cut. Um, and you can literally just do this too. And you would find that moment um, when we went to like sharing the screen or something or at Carolyn's introduction that you would edit it at. Um, so you'll see there are pauses, but a lot of them are natural. So I'm just skimming here to make sure there's no other large unnatural pauses that I want to get rid of. 
but this looks pretty clean. So here we go. This is another one. Um, normally I would play this to make sure I'm not editing out anything important, but like I said, I've, I've actually cheated and edited this movie beforehand. So I do know what it needs. And I'm gonna go ahead here, split the clip again, just so, so you can see it and move that down. Um, I do the same thing at the end as I do in the beginning, which is I have an ending slide that I use for a lot of stuff. I don't upload that because it's in my library already. I have to find the right colored one. There we go. So I would drag and drop that ending slide in. I usually use one that has our phone number on it well, but for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go fishing for that. I'd add another cross dissolve. And then I can go all the way back to the beginning of my clip and I can just copy this clip. I don't have to split it again. I don't have to redo it again. I can just copy it, get that audio and bring it all the way to the end as an outro. I can see that she is not talking here. So there's her outro. Slap that down, move it to where it needs, and I can drag that fade in, fade out rather, into a fade in. We get this. Buy yogurt fruit dip and enjoy. And that's how I would end it. But we're not done yet because one of the things that Amy does in this she tells the kids what ingredients they need and I like to help her out with that so I will normally I will kind of find the point where she starts talking about the ingredients like I said I added this before so I know it starts about here and again just in spark or you can do this in canva I make some simple pictures I'm gonna go back to where she picks up the right there we go so this is the picture that I made um, that I've dropped on top of this. So when I'm dropping it on top, I'm kind of creating a layer. So if you've used anything like Photoshop, you know that the pictures are layers. So by dropping it on top, this is the, the, the predominant image. But you can see it gives me choices now in editing it that we previously didn't see before. This is called a cutaway. So if I left it like this, as she was talking, it is some type of... It has a natural fader that you can add in. Like it fade in. To be some type of whip top. But I really like seeing Amy. I don't want to use a cutaway. You can see, by the way, um, there is no opacity choice here. So you can make that as opaque or as um, solid as you want. But I don't want to use a cutaway. This is where you can do your green screening or a split screen, which would look like that but I don't want to use that either. This, by the way, is a PNG file. So um, all its edges are clear, essentially. That's why it goes to black around the edges. I want a picture and picture. So picture and picture can be a lot of things. It can actually be another video clip. So you could edit like a sports highlight reel, essentially, of, of uh, an anchor talking, and you could put a second video clip up here. That's again, when like detaching the sound becomes important. Um, and you could have, you know, a silent film playing in the corner. What I like to do is just make this big enough that you can see all the ingredients. Recipe is, like. recipe is some type of whip topping. Um, this is like Cool Whip, except it's a little healthier. Cool. Now, normally what I would do then is stretch this until she stops talking about the ingredients so that they're up on the screen <laughs> about them. Um, and I do the same thing for tools for her recipes since they're for young children. It tells them what things they may need as well. So that means I've touched almost every part of this movie. There's now an intro, a image. Um, I've done sound. If I want to do filters, I've done those. There's an intro, there's an outro. I've cut out all the extraneous bits. The last thing that remains is for me to rest this file out of iMovie so I can put it somewhere else. And that you do very simply by hitting this top export button. So you hit export file. It does say you can export directly to YouTube and Facebook. I've tried to set this up several times and I've never really been happy with how it comes out. It never seems to work like I'd want it to. You will notice you can put it right in an email. So if you did want to email it to your proofer, your you know, proof watcher, you could email it right here. But this does work, I think, only with um, your max email, which if you're like me is my personal email, not my work email, we use Gmail. So this may not, um, configure for you, but it is there if it does. 
save current frame. So if you just want to take, that's one way to do a, um, a thumbnail. If you prefer your thumbnail to be like a live action thumbnail, you could just save the current frame and use that as your thumbnail. It will save it as a picture. But right now we want to choose export file. This is where you can rename your video. You can type a description. I usually don't do this because I wind up typing a description in YouTube anyway. This could be helpful for your own notes if you don't remember what's in every movie. Just like any file on your computer, give it a distinct name that you're going to remember. Uh, tags, um, this is the tagging system within um, Mac filing. I don't particularly use it. You do want to use the video and audio format, um, but you can do audio only if that's all you want to export. Resolution, you'll see that 1080p is blocked out. It's not because my computer can't process that. Um, it's simply that this video was shot in 720, so I can't escalate it up to 1080. Um, if someone has a 1080 camera, that will work fine. Uh, your compression, you can choose to have a faster compression, which means it'll export faster or better quality, which will be slower. And you'll choose, if you choose better quality, um, not better quality, if you change your resolution rather, it'll change the size of the file. So that's the file size, you'll see it 540, it's 287 MBs, goes up to 486. And that might be important if it's like a two hour long movie and you're concerned that it's like 10 gigabytes and it is gonna tell you how long it is. Click next. And it's gonna ask you where you wanna save it. So you may wanna have a dedicated file. Now I'm just gonna go right to my desktop, click save. And that's when our circle is gonna come up. And you're gonna see it's gonna start filling that circle in as it works to export it. Um, the only feature I didn't show you that I think is really useful is the voiceover. So we're just at 258. So real quick, I am gonna show you how to do a voiceover um, because I think it's really helpful, but we'll wait for this video to be done exporting. You may find everything also the computer moves a little slower while an export is going on. So if you're exporting like a two hour long movie, um, maybe plan that at the end of your day <laughs> so it doesn't slow down everything else while you're working on it. All right, it's almost done and we should get a notification flying in, which you probably won't be able to see because I'm sharing the program alone. I don't know if you're gonna see this, but you should get a float in um, saying share successful, exporting it was successful and you can even click show and it'll open up your file folder and show you where it is. Once that happens, you can share it anywhere. Um, so just for argument's sake, let's say, I don't know, um, Amy just sent me this video and she wanted me to add the audio. So I can detach that audio you, and I can delete the audio from her version. And voiceover is this little microphone down here. And it's going to give me a countdown when I get ready. So when I go into that voiceover, you can see this green bar is telling me that it's receiving my microphone input. And I can hit record. And it's going to count me in from wherever my little bar is there. This is Miss Amy, and she'll be making yogurt dip today. You have to make sure that you stop it, because <laughs> I have recorded a lot of silence by accident. When you're ready to listen to it, you actually have to click Done here, so you get back to your preview. Now it'll sound like this. Miss Amy, and she'll be making yogurt dip today. So you can add a voiceover as long or as short as you want. My tip to you, if you're going to do a voiceover is have a script in front of you that you're reading off of. Um, PowerPoint does have this transition that is effectively a teleprompter that you can use. Um, so you can certainly use that, but excuse me, it's gonna take you significantly longer to do a voiceover if you're just doing it off of the top of your head. Um, no matter how clever and how good at memorizing you are, I promise you will make more mistakes that way. If you have it all written out, you can read it. You can then go back in and edit your voiceover so you can stop and start it as many times as you need to. The toughest part of a voiceover is just making sure it lines up with what you want it to line up with. So you may wind up moving it around a lot like this, but it's a good asset because you can move it around. You'll also see that it's sitting over music. And that's another place where I can hit that lower volume with other clips the music doesn't accidentally dominate it. What's cool about that is let's say you do have a song at the full three minutes without that. 
what it'll do for you. Let's say you do have a clip show and you're only going to, you're going to leave a picture up for 30 seconds, but you're only going to introduce it in 10 seconds. The music will swell back up so you can hear it. Miss Amy and she'll be making yogurt dip today. So the volume will re-increase after your clip if you do that lower clip, uh, lower volume of other clips. So that can be really good. Like, let's say you're doing a quick history of your library in like a four minute video. Um, so you're introducing each picture and then you're letting the picture sit. The music will fill back up and then dip back down as you come back in. Um, all of the menus I showed you today are repeated up here. Your import, your opening of libraries, your trimming, your cutting and pasting. So if you prefer menus, a lot of that stuff, your freeze frame over here, all of that stuff um is all repeated in here including your play play from beginning that's the other thing one last thing i promise um if you want to preview your video but you don't you want to see it full screen you can just hit this arrow button in the bottom right and that gives you miss amy and she'll be making yogurt dip today and you can just hit escape to get up Whew, so i know i took you on a, a whirlwind tour i'm going to leave iMovie up for questions um, and we'll go from there. So I can see we already have a question in the chat. I don't see any in the Q and A. Um, don't you want her original audio after the voiceover? Yeah, so you could separate her audio and clip it to begin after the voiceover, but what I'd probably do with that, if that's how I wanted to run it. By the way, all I'm doing is hitting undo. You can hit undo until the cows come home. Probably what I would do is um, split the clip. So where I wanna speak, I would split the clip and I would detach the audio just from that clip. And then her audio could fade in and I could even fade it in if I don't want it to come out um, all at the same volume. So if I want to go from my voice to her voice. Was I that comprehensive? <laughs> no one needs to know anything else. Oh, green screens. Okay, so green screening is a great question. It's also the scrambled audio here. Um, so I'm just gonna grab one of their backgrounds. So let's say you want this to be your new background. You would have this back backgrounds and then you would add the image over. Um, so we'll use that. This tools image. This is actually good for the person who was asking me about going virtual to horizontal. So what I could do here is do that green blue screen. And now your image, your vertical image would have a moving background. Carol said we can only add 2.3 minutes at a time of our backgrounds and have to add it again. Yeah, it, it'll do that. It wants you to loop them, which is kind of a pain, um, but you can just copy paste them, which I do. I even do that with music sometimes and just loop the music. Um, Erica says, so after your proofreader finds something in the exported video that needs to be changed, you can go back into the project and you can reset or re-edit. Absolutely. So the exported file itself is like a, it's kind of like a, think of it like a PDF versus a Word document. Once it's exported, it's much more like a PDF. It's kind of, um, someone could pop it into their iMovie and start editing it, but they wouldn't have the full access the way you did because everything's melded together. It's been mushed together just like editing the PDF, it's way harder, but you always will have your project here. Um, your project exists as an editing, is a Word document that's kind of constantly in progress. As long as you save it, you know, and you don't delete it, you can go back in. The big issue becomes if you edit a lot of videos, you're going to run into a storage issue because movie files are large. So you may want to put, um, you may want to start backing up your iMovie library or saving your iMovie library to an external hard drive if you're going to be doing a lot of big files. And then you don't have to worry about running out of room. I think for about $40 or $50, you can get a tetrabyte hard drive. I always joke with my husband because we started dating 16 years ago. And the first thing that he bought me was a half gig flash drive that cost him $30. And now for $30, I think you can get almost a tetrabyte. <laughs> so things have, uh, have changed dramatically. Um, was there a limit to the length of the video you can edit? Um, I haven't found one yet. I think the longest like original file, which I did cut down was almost two hours. 
what starts to happen is it just is going to start to bog down the processor on your computer. Um, you know how I said I always do the sound and the, and the um, coloring editing before I clip? The exception is for really long files like that. If it's going to be an hour and a half, I'm going to go through and hack it down quite a bit beforehand so that when I am making changes, because audio particularly, if you're doing like just hitting auto on the audio, if it's a really long file, it's going to take a while. So I actually will cut out before in that case. Um, most videos that I think most libraries are going to be working on aren't that long. That only really becomes a problem when you like reach like the 45 minute mark. What if you show the proofreader a couple of different options? Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> I know that sounds horrible, um, but send them something and then let them tell you what they don't like about it and adjust from there. It's not like doing, if you're used to doing graphic design, um, it's not that it's easier, it's just different. And with graphic design, I know I, I do all the signs in our library as well. You can come up with three different colorations of an image, um, save it as three separate files, no big deal. With iMovie, you're in your project. So you'd have to like duplicate and make multiple versions of your project. And it becomes a storage issue. These, like I said, are not small files and you can very quickly junk up your hard drive that way. So what, I, what you could do is send somebody a version of your exported file and say, hey, if you don't like the colors or if you notice anything, I can correct those, but I wouldn't send them different options. When I say you need a proofreader, like it's to catch things that are like egregious. Um, like, you know, I have done things where the title card I pulled because I had like 30 identical title cards um, for a story time series and I accidentally put the wrong title card in front. I want people to catch that. You want to upload it like that. That's kind of what I mean by proofreader. Um, Tara has, you mentioned horizontal versus vertical filming on iPhone, on iPhone and iPad. Do you have any suggestions or tips about the camera being off to the side. I, did you mean like filming at an angle or something like that? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'll let you respond, Tara, and I'll just answer the other question. So Paul asked me, have you ever used Final Cut? And if so, what did you think? I do have Final Cut. Um, Final Cut, if you're not aware, it's Final Cut Pro. It's the um, Mac equivalent of Adobe Premiere. So it's a more robust movie editor. It's awesome. Um, but <laughs> it's got a bigger learning curve than this does. Um, so again, it's like, what is your end result? Do you want something that is a simple story time video or something like that? Um, or do you want something that has really good production quality and gives you more increased, if you like, want better green screening, um, the reason I decided to do iMovie for this presentation is because it is a lower cost entry fee as well. Uh, Final Cut Pro, Cut Pro can run you a couple hundred dollars. Um, I do use it. I love it, but it is more complex than iMovie for sure. Okay. So Tara, uh, yes, my eyes look funny when I'm trying to look at the camera on my iPad. My phone works much better. Um, so you find that you're like looking off to the side, essentially, when you see the video. Um, so that's a filming thing. What I would recommend is do a couple of test takes and find your eye line where it does look like you're looking straight on. Um, and then put a post-it flag on your iPad at the point that you want to look. Um, you have to give yourself an eye line. So even today when I'm presenting, I do have a little version of my screen. Um, it's a little bit different today because I have to look at the program as I'm manipulating it. But on your Mac, there's a little green light that turns on on your webcam. So I tend to try and look at the light to look like I'm making eye contact. So yeah, that would be our recommendation is a post-it with a little arrow um, that just catches your eye because then you'll look there. Um, I don't know if vertical or horizontal makes a huge difference with that because you have to look in the right spot ultimately. So Pam asks, if you're editing on your phone, how do you access the filters and asset menus? So I'm not as familiar as editing in iMovie on a phone. I do it on a laptop personally. Um, shout out to people who do it on their phone. I'm extremely impressed by you because it's a small screen to do editing on. My guess is it's probably partially accessible, but on a phone app, they're probably not going to make the full program available. So there may be just things that you can't do 
the asset menu in particular, I'd wonder how they would pull that. I would imagine you can still access your iMovie, your iTunes library, but I don't know how much image storage it might let you pull from. You can pull from your own photos. Um, I'm not going to click into it because like I said, this is my home computer, but um, you, this thing here, which I didn't talk about in your libraries, you can access your, your photo app on your, um, on your computer and get all of your own photos in there. Um, what kind of feedback have you gotten? I need to ask, I'm sorry. What kind of feedback have you gotten from patrons read all the clips you're distributing, trying to engage ROI? What kind of vids seem to get the best reaction? So it's a good question. <laughs> Your return on investments in videos is uneven at best. Um, I won't tell you that we've had tons and tons of runaway hits. The video we had do the absolute best was our really awesome local history librarian who does edit his own videos, so I can't even take credit for it. Um, Joe Barbieri did a really, really great video on um, how our area, Clarkstown area, dealt with the 1918 epidemic. And the journal news picked it up and referenced it. So that has like well over a thousand hits. Um, another one, which again, I can't take credit for was um, we got a donation. Um, I don't know all the details, but I'd have to ask Brian Jennings, um, our head of adult services, but we got a donation of some video news clips, historical news clips. And um, we have one a live reporting of the Brinks robbery, um, which is a big deal around here. And that's gotten a lot of hits. Um, things will also get popular and you won't know why until you look at your statistics. One of our librarians did a poem a month last April and one of the poems is extremely popular. And when I looked at the uh, traffic, it turned out it was because it was assigned on an online school platform. <laughs> and we got a several comments on that. It was all middle schoolers complaining about having been assigned the poem in school. We have another children's virtual story time that's extremely popular. It's because a Korean school has picked it up, I guess, for an English class uh, for young kids. So that can happen <laughs> on YouTube in the Wild West. Um, our numbers have gone down as the pandemic is at, I think, not to say it's over, but that we're at a low. Um, the children's librarians have been the most consistent about doing videos. So theirs get better hits probably because of that. However, I will say our adult services librarians have done um, really straightforward webinars on how to use different databases, how to use OverDrive, which is great because they do all the video, you know, they tape the whole thing and all I have to do is really cut it down and clean it up, post it. And then that's somewhere we can even direct people when they have reference questions about those if they want a more in-depth guide. So for instance, this morning we had a webinar on consumer reports online so I know once I clean that up, post it up, not only will it naturally get some hits, it'll also get um, distributed by our reference librarians when somebody wants more of an explanation on how to use a resource. So those can be really useful. They may not get huge numbers, but they give another avenue. You know, not everyone learns by, um, by reading. So it's a really good aid for people who are visual learners. All that to say, I mean, none of our videos are viral. And frankly, as a library, it's not really something I'm aiming for. Um, viral is funny. <laughs> I don't know that it's useful for libraries necessarily. Um, so, you know, if you want to do a coordinated music video to carts, like they do uh, sometimes at ALA, go for it. <laughs> but I think, um, that's why I like iMovie because it's, it's light. Once you get adjusted to it, I can now edit a story time video in six or seven minutes. Sometimes it takes longer to upload than it takes me to edit it. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, videos for instructional stuff is great, especially if you have access to OverDrive and you've ever had that person say to you at a party, I didn't know that the library offered eBooks. Well, I guess there's a whole video on it on our YouTube channel. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just encourage you to experiment and mess around because one of the things I did wind up doing with this, um, and one of the reasons I dipped my toe in was I did do a video right at the beginning of the pandemic explaining that we were still open virtually. Um, and that was what you can do on YouTube is set a video that automatically plays when someone gets to your channel. 
So that got a lot of plays because of that. And I think it was a very good opportunity for us to promote ourselves. Um, and if I may toot my own horn, I did a stop motion animation with my child's toys when we started doing curbside pickup. Um, so if you allow me to indulge you know, myself a little bit, I can show you what it can look like when you start blending skills. You know, we were talking about right before um, we started about how anything you learn isn't lost. So this was something I learned from one of our children's librarians. It's a little free app that lets you do stop motion. In between iMovie and stop motion, this is what I did. Coming Monday, June 15th, the New City Library will be offering curbside pickup. Our super staff will be standing by at 845-634-4997, extension 125, for adult and teen materials, or 121 for children's materials. Have your library card at the ready. Our super team will locate the materials and call you back as soon as they're ready for pickup. Curbside or portico pickup? You decide! There will be a line up the ramp to our portico where you can wait at a safe distance from other patrons. A staff member will be standing by to assist you. Or you can choose curbside pickup. Arrive, park in a designated space, and call 845-634-4997, extension 124, to notify a staff member that you've arrived. They will bring the materials right to your car. The online catalog will open for holds on June 22nd. Please note that all dates are subject to change by state and local authorities as well as the library administration. Please note you can only place holds on New City Library. So you can see I had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> um, and we did get 300 hits on it. People watched it. I put it, um, I promoted it in our e-newsletter, um, you know, with a link to explaining it. So it's just, I, I only show that not so much to do my own horn, although I'm very proud of that, <laughs> as silly as it was. And yes, the background you're correct, Sarah, is from the Nancy Pearl action figure. <laughs> I had never opened that box until that day. And also the books, that's where the books were from. I had one afternoon without my son or husband and that's what I did with it on my kitchen table. Um, but my point is that you can just get creative and you can promote a message in ways that are unexpected and fun. I do want to um, circle back because I don't want to miss it because um, Carolyn, remarked um, something important, which is that Southeastern members can borrow a Skillshare membership and learn about iMovie from there. And if you're not in the Hudson Valley, you can check with your local library council to see if they also offer the service. And she has a link to Skillshare. Um, also, if your library has access to LinkedIn Learning, LinkedIn Learning does have a pretty comprehensive iMovie class. So that's what I have to offer. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, I know I left a lot of time for questions, but I had a feeling there'd be a few. <laughs> so. Hi, I thought I'd pop back in um, and just say thanks because you're getting so many thanks and stuff. And um, all right, so I guess with that, I'll just kind of wish everybody a happy uh, afternoon. And um, again, you can reach us if you have any questions. And um, yeah, take care, everybody.